Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session is on unguided imaging with ASA mounts, and it's going to be presented by Krister Strand. But uh, as always, before we jump into that, we do have our image of the week, and um, due to, of course, the uh, change with uh, Google, I don't have that page open, so I am going there right now. Um, bear with me while I pull it up so I can show off the great image of the week. And this week's Image of the Week winner is Adam Landefeld. And let me jump back and share my screen. There you go, Adam Landefeld's uh, Crescent Nebula. And a really nice image. Uh, now's the time. Hit this target if you want to. And Adam, who has won our Image of the Week in the past, so he's welcome to come on next week if you'd like to uh, just chat about it for a little bit. Adam, uh, contact me via contact at Astro Imaging Channel or I'm sorry, contact at theastroimagingchannel.com uh, if you'd like to come on and talk about it. Otherwise, um, there are a few places for you guys to submit your images, uh, whether you just share a photo with me on Google+, put it on Facebook, or heck, just post it on Cloudy Nights, and if we see some good images, then uh, we might just start randomly choosing people. But uh, yeah, that's it. And I'm going to jump back over, take my screen back, because now that I see some viewers on, uh, you guys may have noticed something. Uh, Google's changing what we're doing. I said a little bit of this last week. And, um, yeah, some, someone's already having trouble getting on. But, uh, okay, so what are you noticing that's different? Well, you're watching us on YouTube, uh, YouTube Live. Google has moved Hangouts on Air to, Google, uh, to YouTube. And uh, this is basically the way we're going to have to do our presentations. We have lost Q&A. So it's going to be a different way that you're going to get us questions. If you'd like, you can post them in the comments of this video, which you'll see right below the screen where I'm talking. Or you'll notice a chat window. And I have the chat opened. It pops right out of uh, where it is, so I can watch chat while I'm talking. And if you guys start asking questions or go on to some uh, specific um, topic, then I can bring it up with Krister. And that'll be our way to communicate. So, uh, and you know, if you want to, just chat. Uh, that's what it's there for. Uh, I will sort them out. I won't uh, bring up any messages that aren't intended for us. But uh, that's basically what I've got. Uh, so right now, I am going to hand it over to Krister. And Krister, I just clicked you, so now we see your screen. Okay. Hi guys. <clears throat> I'm uh, here over in Sweden. And we would make a presentation about uh, ASA mounts. I'm a reseller in Sweden. I have uh, not in direct contact with uh, ASA, so I perhaps can't answer all detailed questions. All right, so I start off my PowerPoint then. I hope you see my full screen now. We do. Yeah. So we start with uh, the ASA is located in. Austria in the middle of Europe and uh, have been uh, developing high quality astrophotography equipment all over the world. Uh, and also they make uh, most, mostly today they make most professional uh, telescopes up to two meters in size and they have several, uh, of, of several some in uh, Chile also. Okay. So what is uh, direct drive? Uh, traditional motors use, trans use transmission and gearboxes. Um, but professional observatories uh, have used uh, direct drive for uh, some time now. And that's why also I have to start developing this for the semi-professional or the amateur also to have a, um, to, to able to use this technology. So there's no transmission and, and uh, no backlash. So therefore there's no periodic error and uh, no uh, errors in the, the gear shifts. So the ben benefits are the fast acceleration, acceleration. If, if they want to track satellites it can be doing that very fast with this kind of uh, technology. And it's very stable and stiff very precise when they are sleeping to a target. They have quite long life expectancy as there are no moving parts 
Earth Spinner motors. And they're uh, actually quite quiet. I will show a video later late about that. And they have not some, and they have no high car energy consumption. There's little of uh, use of energy, so they can drive this on the battery, car battery. A drive, drive mount take the power coming from the motor and apply it directly on the axis on the, the scope. So there's no gear clutch effect. The speed are, and the control the speed of the motors in real time uh, and about 100 times every second. Uh, and this can be done in both axes at the same time. And except for the motors, that you need to have some good encoders too, and they have some high resolution encoders. Uh, both axes uh, have them, and they have, as I said before, about 100 times per second. So that way, the, that is and should position of the, the position of the scope can be corrected in real time. Because the internal direct eye, uh, they can make this at very high speed. And this is called range or encoders. I'm not sure what the range or is coming from. But the precision for the basic encoders are 0 0.02 arc second resolution. So it's a very high resolution on the encoders. And if there are power loss during observation or restart, when they have absolute encoders, they know where the position is, so they can take off and continue tracking. And from this year, 2016, ASR will deliver only absolute encoders. Before that, they had the simplest mount uh, had some, uh, also they have high resolution encoder, but they was not absolute, so they have to make a calibration start procedure at the startup to find the position for the encoder. But from now on, they have only uh, absolute encoders. So a pointing area. To make the direct drive with high resolution encoders to work, for a guided exposure, we need to wait for correct for position errors in real time. But there are no idle telescopes in them today. And several er errors can happen during sleeving and tracking. The main errors are polar alignment error, a collimation error when the optical axis is not parallel to the mechanical axis, mount error, and tube flexure, and several gear errors, mount flexures. And that's error they have to be corrected for. So how do they do that? They have to, uh, the software can compensate for all this error if they have, as long as they are reproducible. As the, so that is every time the telescope points at a position, it uh, returns to the same position. Uh, because is it, if the telescope is not <coughs> rigid and stable, then the, uh, the problem, well, uh, the pointing errors Correction will not work as good as, and uh, the, so there need to be some stiffness in the telescope. Uh, <clears throat> a point and find a list of observations specifying where the star is really was and uh, where the telescope reader say the star is. This, uh, and to save this measurement in a file uh, called a pointing file. Uh, and the software then works with a set of uh, function to describe <coughs> the errors. And polarment, alignment, collimation, <coughs> mount error. And they have a function then describing these errors combined together. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so that they have a function uh, and, this, and this is saved in the telescope software. And, uh, <coughs> and there are also software taking care of this called Autosleeve. 
we'll come back to that a little bit later. So how is the pointing model used? Uh, the same first thing is to achieve better pointing. Uh, better pointing could also be done without this uh, technique, but the main use is of the point model, model is the it's not only for correcting the pointing, but also to change the tracking speed in error and deck in real time during tracking. So uh, Olmont used the simple CDRL tracking rate and only mode in, <coughs> in a, with an external command. So this is, <coughs> this is the main thing for the pointing model to correct for uh, real, real time when we are guiding. Uh, pointing <coughs> model limitation here. Yeah. You, you can only correct pointing errors if they're reproducible. So you need to have uh, need to, error must be the same, and so you need to point it. The error must be the same at a certain location. It's kind of matter where the telescope is left to this point coming from the east or west. So I need to find, uh, come to the same position all the time. Uh, so it's the basically up to the telescope robustness, the mirror cell, focuser, etc. So we need, so everything needs to be quite robust for this technique to work. And this pointing file is aging by time, uh, so the amount uh, changes over the time. So I, I think about three mo months interval is a good time for making a new pointing file. So uh, not the tracking performance will be reduced. So what do we do if the tracking starts to degrade? Then they have a quite uh, good option there. It's called MLPT. It's coming to rescue when the point, uh, the tracking accuracy starts degrading. <coughs> and then they make a <coughs> local real-time pointing point. I'll show this a bit later. Uh, some errors in the setup then, and the scope and uh, the mount is the two types, the hysteresis and time flex. Hysteresis uh, is a phenomena, point performance cannot be corrected in a, by any point in point. Uh, and it's needed a telescope that is the, the identical behavior during normal usage comparing to uh, the behavior during the point in point. So it needs to behave in the same way. You, when you made a point to find an normal operation. So uh, that's, uh, if that's big difference there, then it's called hysteresis. And this can be measured with the software in, which is included. This is called hysteresis measurement. And the second problem is time flex. The telescope uh, and the whole system can change over time. And this can have mostly two uh, reasons for that. This could be temperature effects and temperature change, and the mode can be uh, change performance and relaxing effects after a sleeve. Telescope is not getting the final position, needs some time to settle. Uh, these are can be measured uh, with the software and can be used to see uh, what you need to do to correct for these errors. Uh, if you have some problem with the uh, the stiffness, the stiffness in the mount, and then you can see that's in the measurement. And the image here, you can see two measurements of the stars. Uh, in the, the middle image, there is about six arc second error from the time flex. So this telescope is at the same location all the time. And, and this, that's the measurement, see how stable it is in this time. Okay. So, Arcel's mount then, they have uh, a low end mount thing. The simplest one is DDM60. This can carry about uh, 62 LBS and a weight about 19 kilo plus uh, counterweight. I think the US price is about $9,000 about. Uh, so, someone told me it's a bit more expensive than a 10 micron scope, but so it's a it's high range for the amateur. And then the middle model is DDM85, can carry some more load, and they have the DDM160, so can carry up to 300 
kilogram. And that have a, um, a pier mount which makes uh, the, the OTA ache never can hit the, the pier. So it's a way to avoid the collision of the mount. The other two models, uh, they can actually, if they go something wrong, they could hit the pier if the something software or similar. Okay, so that's the low end and the high end, and they have a uh, different kind from uh, the DDM160 up to uh, then her azimuth uh, mounts there. Up to 1.4 meters was the latest one they made. And they had an interesting 4 by 8 inch hyperbolic setup. So the mount can handle for. Uh, more than ever know what uh, they have used it for, but uh, except for normal photograph. So they they have some special products there, and uh, the basic with all mounts they have the same control software. So there's no different in the software from the simplest low end to the highest high end mounts. It's the same software base, and this is the DDM60 Pro. You can see the specifics, though. Uh, and the sleeve rate is 13 degrees, and the power on 12 volts, you know, less than one amp, so it should be uh, able to run it on a battery. And this is as com compatible, and they have the cable in the mount house, so you can see in the image they're coming, uh, they have power out for the camera and hooks or something, and they have three. USB outlets for uh, equipment, so uh, that's the good part. All mounts have internal. There was before some mount with uh, not this internal, but nowadays they have internal cabling. And that's a good part. Close up, close up. They have a green laser built into the, the mount to make a rough polar alignment. And this can be activated, and you can uh, watch them make in when you are in field setups. And I have some uh, notes. Okay, I should run this uh, video on. I don't know if the I hear the audio, but it's some birds singing in there. It's a mount. I don't know what kind of mount, uh, what kind of tube is on here. Okay, so it's actually you can hardly hear the mouse sleeving, so that's was a nice feature, but of course not a big deal. Uh, you, but it's one uh, feature of the direct drive technology to have quiet movements. Okay, so also it's in the process now of making a, a, a replacement for the current DDM60. It's called DDM60 Revolution, and this is still in work in progress, so to speak. It should be more compact and have uh, absolute encoders and some automatic polar alignment technique. They have a small computer, should, should probably a, a Linux-based computer you can see uh, in, the, in the marked in the image there. I'm not sure. Uh, I have more, no more detail about this and what you can see in the image. How it would look. So the picture more. This could be Wi-Fi remotely connected with a tablet, I would think, to be controlled. So I think this will be a very interesting a new mount coming up. If they, whenever they will release, I think not nothing earlier than 2017, I would think, for this mount. So I couldn't get any more information about this and uh, about the release day. They're still a work in progress here. So what's the pro and cons for this amount? Of course, this um, guided imaging is a big uh, advantage, and uh, direct drive, of course, and high resolution encoders, internal cabling, and they have the local tracking model is very interesting. I will show you shortly. And there are professional developed software included in this amount. 
And the quality is extremely good, I think, on this very high quality of the all parts of the mount. So uh, the downside is a bit expensive then, and there is a bit learning curve for the software. But I think after I was the first year, I had struggled a little bit at the beginning. But then uh, I think this was more uh, easier to work with the software after uh, startup. So I think it's, you, you think it is more complicated startup than what it actually is. So I think it's uh, well. Easy. I think you can overcome it. And it's controlled software running on the PC, if you think that's a drawback. And they have mostly focused on the professional market, and the support is not perhaps the highest on the low-end mounts. I think they have focused a little more on the professional one. So the control software is uh, these uh, two parts, mainly, outer sleeve and sequence. So outer sleeve is the main control. With controlling the direct drive motors and pointing error correction is made when they have an ASCOM driver. And then they have the sequence software for generating pointing file, uh, for synchronizing the mount and MLT generator I will show you. And autofocus control and they have measurement tools and scripting tools for acquiring uh, a batch observation and some uh, anon dome control and also focus control. So uh, here is the setup I would say about the system with the computer in the center there and they have a USB connection to the mount and they have a GPS which is included for uh, tracking GPS position and I think uh, they use that for time synchronization also for can you be able to use the uh, pointing technique to have a pointing model technique. Uh, and then they are connecting to a maximum deal for image acquisition then for making the pointing file. And also the pinpoint software. So I think that, that is a required part for the solution here. You need to have the, those maximum DLM pinpoint. Uh, so Besides for pinpoint and maximum deal and the plantarium software, everything is included in the mount, so you don't need to buy any extra software except for the uh, external software. And they have communication with ASCOM for the planetary software part. Okay. It's a minimum requirement for a setup. It's good balance of the system and polar alignment less than 15 arc minutes if you have a portable setup and about less than 5 arc second for a fixed setup. And uh, this is a quite cool feature. This is the balancing tool. So it moves the sound here. Uh, they have a software included uh, to balance the software. They use the direct drive motor current to see how the balance is. Uh, working so the, the tilt uh, the hotel in different direction in this case is a declination balancing so you see two bars here when they're moving north and uh, south and then see how much current then and then you can find very fine tune the balance of the mount using this uh, graphic display then and the same for the arrow axis so this, I think, is a very cool part for the balancing. So yeah, it's not at all hard. You balance in five minutes, then you have the balance set. So the point if I is then I make with the sequence software. This also is quite uh, simple also. Uh, you select how many stars you want covered in uh, the sky. I think normally 10 to 50 stars if you have a permanent setup you can use. So when you have a, a come to the later, when you are in the field and you feel so, then you actually don't need a, a pointing file at all. But this is the way to make it. So you select number of star and then press the start button. And then the mount starts sleeving around the sky at those, those positions you see in the black circle 
here there are some dots and every dot is a selected star and the, the software moves to the every star and take an image then make a plate solve and save the error so, so they know how much error this is at every position there and that's uh, saved in a file it's called a point in file and this file is sent over to the other software autosly who uh, load up the error fields so to call, and calculate a pointing file uh, and making a file for it uh, every time you start it load up that so it's so called error correction file if you call it it's called pointing file and that that file is used that in real time correction for the tracking so we have a two different setup than portable and a fixed setup and uh, when you start when you need to do a polar alignment then you use the green laser light and uh, and you make a rough estimate of the polar star uh, and then you use the sequence to make a polar alignment option and uh, you see in the grass green circles you have three stars at the same declination and the software have selected them and uh, it sleeps and take three images and that's, that file is then sent over to Autosleep, who is, have a polar alignment software, who uh, run and see how much the error is. And then you get the instruction how much you should move uh, the, the mount's uh, position to get, to, uh, you focus on a star in the, in the south, uh, and the software tell you uh, when you have focused the star, then then it tells how much you should move the star. You can so do it. It's very simple, and, and that's an iterative process. So we can get down to 15 and 5 arc minutes resolution, depending on what you need. So it's, when you've done this, sometimes it's not a very long process. Perhaps 10-15 minutes, then you have made this for alignment with the software. If a portable setup installation, you make a polar alignment with PR less than 15 minutes, and optionally you can make a point in file. It's not necessary, not needed really. That you can do to improve accuracy, but uh, actually you can then you should really do the exposure with the so-called MLPT. I will show you shortly. And then the startup at the night session would be you start up the motors. And you make a sync on a star just to improve the accuracy a bit. To take. Normally it's very good pointing us, but I used to make that so, so I want the star dead center when I sleeve to a point star. And that's actually very exact. And, and after that, you are ready for unguided exposure using MLPD. I will show you soon. The fix setup, then you have made, make a point polar alignment uh, less than five arc minutes and make a larger point to find 10 to 50 stars after that uh, you're ready to go and this you make about as I told you before it's about three months in my case I used my point in five for six months and it works okay so I didn't need to change it but uh, uh, they told me that the also guys come here three months in period is a good time to make uh, update of the point in file because of the changes in the setup uh, moments changes over time and the fixed setup startup and night start motor and the optional you can make a sync and then you're ready so it's very small steps to get going when you're making a night session so how to improve the tracking with MLPT I think uh, the M stuff for multi and L stuff for local pointing tracking. I think that's the short for that. It's kind of local pointing file that tracks the scope's movement. So I will show you the next slide. Yeah, so this is the way the MLT works. The software sequence then start at position one in this case and take an image. Uh, this is you. You want to, in this case you want to take a image of the one M fifty one, 
and you go to the just leave to M51 first and then you start an MLT process and then sequence automatically move uh, if you want 20 minutes of unguided exposure it can they move to five steps with five minutes part and take an image and play it all and then moves after the last image moves back to the starting position and that uh, information is saved in a file and sent over to the control software. We now have a local pointing file which take care of any errors which is for the actual time the exposure is taking place. This is a very high resolution pointing file so to speak. So if your big normal point file is degrading or is not so good, this MLTP can take care of this and uh, cover for the errors you have. And you can see in this slide you can see the error graph. In this case you have arrow and deck arrows about 10 arc seconds. So in this case you can see sort of if, if the lines, if the blue lines have been parallel with the horizontal line then you have a perfect idle telescope. In this case you have a small error but it's very small. So this is a way for you to see that your scope is not optimal but this pointing MLTP pointing local file take care of this residual error to speak and it's sent over to the outer sleeve software and it activated so this this po local pointing file is overriding the big pointing file uh, in the time the time of the uh, exposure so after if you have 20 minutes of exposure after the exposure finish then uh, it stops working. So you have a good pointing file in that time being. The sequence software also have a sequence uh, batch processing where you can add uh, objects and you have a dome control and here you can make a sequence like a sequence of what object you want, what filter you want and it have automatic focus and also MLTP so when it change object in the night it's make automatically make MLTP so you don't need to be sitting at your computer so this is the way it can make automatic MLTPs and uh, by a, a sequence list. Uh, currently today this is not supported MLTP is not supported by other software what I have found out so I hope they can make support for this so other uh, third party vendors can use this MLTP feature. So today if you want MLTP for every exposure then you need to use this sequence software. So that would be a little bit drawback. Okay, so uh, here's a real test of the MLTP. Uh, this we have uh, I'm in uh, now in Sweden have two uh, um, mounts a DDM60 and a DDM85. And this was the image with a and in 85 with a ASO 10 inch and with a 20 minutes uh, unguided exposure and you have a zoom here to the right with 600 percent you can see this pretty good result with the MLTP. And this was made with a DDM 85 with a 12, 12 inch and this is without MLTP this is a point if I with 10 stars I think this was about four or five months old point file and still made pretty good uh, follow for 20 minutes even at the small point file. This was a stationary observatory. Uh, so this, I think this is real good performance. It's another image of the same setup. So uh, normal guiding versus point file. So since we're correct, I think you think what's the difference between making normal guiding versus pointing file? Uh, one drawback by normal guiding is that it takes some time for the image to be processed and downloaded and applied. But this MLTP knows what to correct and do that in real time, 100 times second. So it should be a more a direct update of the corrections. Uh, that's what I think, but I have not 
tested this. I not heard some one have made some different some test to see what's the difference between normal guide and pointing point. But my guess is, is the pointing point should be more accurate as it makes more corrections uh, as more faster oh, updates. So uh, ASA telescope system they have astrographs from 8 inch up to 20 inch. It's about price from oh, about six thousand dollars up to twenty six thousand dollars, and they had a high end, and I have no price for that because I think it's not for amateur uh, range, I would say. So uh, my conclusion is that the direct drive technology works, and the direct drive is probably the future of mount technology, and unguided imaging, I think, also is the future for mount technology. I think the automated setup for mount has improved with time, so it's more easier by the day to make polar alignment and uh, make quick setup and coming, uh, starting up. As I saw before, also is dedicated to the professional market, and I think they have, as they have made a, uh, they want, they have some mount for low end is the way for us to amateur to follow the, the latest technology, I think. I think ASA, ASA is one of the first companies with direct drive, what I know, uh, have developed. Okay, so that was basically my presentation. I had some, if there's time, I can show you some in progress, how the actual software works. But I also have run at 30 minutes. I think I can take some questions and see if there are some uh, so you have some feedback from you. Yep. So one of the first questions, and I think we got the answer, but maybe for everyone, um, everyone out there, uh, the software comes with it, MLPT, Auto SLU, but you would still need um, Maxim D, uh, either Maxim yeah. DL or the Sky, right? So that's a separate package you have to buy. Yeah, as you see in this image, you need to actually buy Maxim DL. And I, I'm not sure. I don't think this, they have support for other Maxim D, uh, other than Maxim DL, But uh, I have not heard anyone run other than that. And then you need also a, a pinpoint. Right, pinpoint. Uh, yeah. I think if you have Maxim DL, you have the light version of pinpoint included. I think that perhaps will be enough. But uh, does, then the planetary software can be any uh, one. That's not connected to this ASCOM standard, so that should be no problem. Okay. Um, the First of all, I'll comment, their factory looks amazing, doesn't it? Uh, you showed it in their first picture, and it looks, I don't know, it looks like a factory that an astronomer designed. Um, yeah, yeah, they have a lot of high take, uh, as I said, the quality of the mount, I will show you. I think I think their factory looks like it's equatorial, equatorially mounted. Yeah. You see, the, the quality is exceptionally good on the mounts. There's like every detail on the top is high quality, so they have left out nothing. Yep. So that so that's a mark of this. I think there's close to Switzerland where they're making watches. So I think it has a tradition there in this area to making high quality equipment. Um, one of the things that you commented on, and I know it was. Uh, one of the important things with this particular mount is balance. And they have the yeah. software routine that shows you when you're in balance. Uh, yeah. I seem to remember people really drilling home that issue that balance is really important. I even remember someone saying that uh, they were taking their uh, $8,000 mount or their $9,000 mount and their $6,000 tube and taping silver dollars to like the front of it to balance it. Is it really that important? Uh, a couple of grams could. Uh... Yeah, it's, it's not critical that you have exactly the balance, but with this tool is very easy to run. Also, if you're unsure if you have made some changes, you just, just run the tool and see if this uh, red bars is about the same. That's so it's not very critical, but it should be about the same uh, place there when you're running this uh, tool. So it's a, it's not hard to 
fine, but this very sensibly, I can move a small gram of weight on the mount, and it shows up on the graph here. Very, so it's a very deep, I can say, fine tuned software to make. But it's, as I read the forum, some guys say the balance is not very critical, but it's good to have a good balance. So that's why. Okay. So it's, um, a question from the chat. Uh, what happens if there's a power failure? The mount seems to not have brakes. Yeah, so, some think that's a pro I have never had a problem with that. So if you have full sleeve and uh, power goes out, then of course it's continue. But it's loose then, so the impact of course will be, will be hard. But, but I don't, that should, that could be a problem if you have very high sleeve rate, but you can correct it. sleeves not very high, so it it's in balance. Remember, it's in balance, so it will not the moment is there, but it should stay stop in white. But uh, you have a corrector, it's it's loose, so it could actually hit the mount. Actually, but I have never had that problem just uh, to hit it in sleeve, so. So you have need to you have a UPS then so keep sure you have no power out when you're sleeping. Okay, and I, I know even from my mount, um, I had uh, the motor box work loose and I was out of balance. And uh, if I was in balance, it wouldn't have when I uh, when the motor worked loose. If I was in balance, it wouldn't have hit the pier. But because I was out of balance, it did hit the pier. So that's one of those things where. You, if you keep it in balance and you lose power, even if the clutches are open or it's completely loose, it's not going to move. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're out of balance uh, and your RA axis is going to flip, then you're in a little bit of trouble. Yeah, absolutely. So you need to keep it in balance. Um, I know with the direct drive mounts, if you're slewing, uh, and I should say the encoder direct drive mounts particularly, if you're, uh, you're, I shouldn't say slewing, if you're tracking the stars and you push on it with your finger, you'll feel it push back a little bit because it's constantly trying to fix its position. Yeah. Um, so, so it really is uh, kind of actively... Yeah, if you, if you have a wind gust coming... Exactly. It's, it's correcting that very good. So it's, uh, that's a good feature, I think. So it's, uh, you can feel... Uh, if you also have a... If you run the mount in the pier, it's have a current protection system, so it's stop the motors and it get loose. So you can't burn the motors, so to speak. But then you should, if you have, should be some problem there. So to have some correction if the the current get up too high. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, with MLPT. Um, each so you you have auto slew which basically takes care of most of the uh, pointing yeah. and in in kind of the tracking, but MLPT is target specific, so it will basically depending on where it's pointed in the sky, it'll take those additional exposures and see if there's going to be error at that particular area of the sky. Yeah. So. Right you basically run an MLPT for each target, uh, which sounds like a pain in the butt, but you did say uh, yeah. it automates the process. It lets you automatically run the MLPT for each target, correct? Yeah, that's how you can automatically, yeah, correct. For my own, when when you start up, I have made a new pointing file. I, I usually don't use the pointing file. If you have shorter exposure, like five or ten minutes, I never use MLTP. Mm -hmm. When I get up to 20 minutes, then I start using perhaps MTP. Then it's it's more or could drift more. So that's the thing. That's why I have worked. I use it when I think it's the time the exposure get up. But otherwise, it's I keep. It. And it's also a good way to see how your mount is uh, set up. If you see this image, you can see obviously you have small errors in our. Arrow and declination, then you can perhaps make a new polar alignment or something. So it gives you information also about your status of your setup, so to speak. But it's interesting too, for us, if you are in the field, 
Uh, then you can just mount your maker up polar alignment and then actually start MLTV work directly in the field if you have traveled over. And uh, that's the big advantage of the MLTP in the portable set, so to speak. You can correct uh, locally for that. So you don't need to have a nice pointy file at all. You can just make a basic polar alignment and then start tracking. Okay, that's so, interesting. So MLPT is optional in some, se well, in, in, in general it is optional, but it if you're pushing them out, it kind of helps a little bit for yeah. longer exposures. For, for portable imaging, it's I would say not optional. It's, you actually need it, but for fixed setup, you can actually say it's op optional. Uh, that can be a way to say it. Okay. Um, two questions from chat. What's the lead time? How long does it take it to uh, them to uh, after you order it to get one to you? And does it have collision protection? And I think you mentioned um, yeah. The, the, collision, yeah, the collision protection is the current uh, limiting. Right. And they stop the motors directly. And uh, the lead time, it, when I ordered the two months, it was three months uh, lead time. But I sp spoke to them last week. They have some in stock. So if you're lucky, there could be some in stock. But actually, often they have about three months lead time, I would say. Okay. I'm going to ask you the tough question here. How long after you bought the mount were you up and running and imaging? How, did it take a few days before you got yourself familiar with it, or were you up the first night? I would say, I uh, say, at first you were a little bit it, it did it intimidated about could it handle all this, and then I run all the detail in the software. I made manual point, but I didn't use the sequence software. We can all, always do everything manually. Also, make a you go on the sky and point manual. So I made a lot of manual steps to learn the the technique. But after perhaps a week or two, I see oh, why why not go with the automatic step? So I went with the sequence after, and then everything was more flowing. So I would say I take two weeks before I. So what I okay I now I learned the technique and I can go for the more automatic uh, softer part because you you perhaps you, in the beginning you want to know what you're doing and then you that's the learning curve you want to know what's the pointing by how it works like that but if I would start today fresh I would go directly to the sequence software with, with very fast startup time I would say but. At the beginning, you were a little afraid if you can handle the software. So, so I think you have two weeks at least to, to get figure out the software part. But when you when when you learn basics, then it's I think it's quite easy to use. And they are constantly uh, improving MLPT and and their software in general. So I know yeah. when it first came out, a lot of people were really intimidated by it. But uh, a few tweaks they made to the software, and all of a sudden, people that were a little frustrated, I think, said, "Well, wow, this is really easy now." Yeah. So uh, the, the the latest they, they made an update for uh, the point of value called Superfit model. They have a Fourier analysis fit. So I talked to the developer. He is a German guy who is so it was direct feedback to have a forum with beta testing so you can be in direct contact with the developer of the software. So we, we got some feedback to how to improve our tracking. So it helped us there. But actually he's improving the software but he doing mostly for the professional part of the telescope. So so we are it's a good interest to see uh, you can get the latest technology there. And the next question that was asked and answered in chat was uh, if something fails in the model or you can't figure it out, can you use auto guiding with it? Uh, yeah, you, you can use normal guiding, as you say, auto. You mean normal guiding. Right. Guiding. Yeah, that's no problem. That's, you can use it as normal guiding. That's no problem. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to ask you a, a specific question because I know you have an ASA. 
tube, um, and it's the you have the Newtonian, right? The F three point eight. Yeah. Yeah. So they have they offer two different types of Newtonian telus astrographs. Yeah. Um, one of them I think is F three point six, and then one of them is faster than that, I believe. Uh, yeah. The, the interesting part is the corrector. They have three types of correctors. So the, the, the tube is actually 2.7, 3.6, 3.8, and uh, 6.2, I think. There's three different focal rate depending on the corrector lens. So they have a reducer and a barlow and just a windy corrector, they call it. This is basic correct. And that's a very high quality also. So this three inch uh, corrector is part of the tube. So you, you can get three uh, F-steps in this uh, astrograph. So, so if you like a more wide field, you just put the uh, reducer and you have 2.7, very fast. That's a little more, more tricky with the collimation and very fast, but it, I run all three of those correctors. And this uh, design, same guy developed in the mounts who make the corrector lens. And, and it's in the market, it's the high quality also. And they have their own focuser, it's very high resolution steps, so also in that, so that's a good feature. Um, is your mirror um, parabolic? No, uh, no, yeah, I see, it should be parabolic. They have a hyperbolic mirror. Right. Uh, yeah. There's one model with hy hyperbolic, also. this parabolic. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, I was reading a little bit about them, and I, I think um, the, as I understood it, the hyperbolic mirrors are easier to correct and make faster, but they're a lot more difficult to produce, so they're a lot more expensive. And the, and the parabolics, you can use like a wind corrector and get them down to f2.8 or so. Yeah, correct. That's right. Yeah. They are really nice tubes. Yeah. This is carbon fiber, and uh, every part is high quality also there. So it's excellent tube. The only part I had was the second mirror. They don't make the, the mirror, so it was actually not perfectly flat. So I got some uh, astigmatism that replaces very quickly. There's a good service there if there's some problem with the equipment, they replace it fast. Very cool. Um, uh, Hamza is asking, uh, getting down to f2.6, how often do you have to collimate? Uh, actually, I think I do it two, two times I made it last season. Uh, because I, I also I changed between 3.6 and the 2.7. But it, actually, it's a bit hard sometimes. In the corners, you can get some elongation of the stars. You can, uh, so, but at the first, I had problem was there was a little problem with the secondary mirror. So, I thought I had uh, astigmatism. I had some collimation problem, but but actually astigmatism. I couldn't distinguish between the two. But uh, after I changed the mirror, then I could easily better collimate. But as, as you say, it's not easy to collimate the 2.7 uh, uh, setup. But uh, I, you can get some. Star in the corner if you're not perfect collimated in the corner, but actually, uh, so it's more tricky. I think with um, any time you're trying to go that fast, uh, just having a solid build quality in the tube is the most important thing. Um, I've heard uh, a few people using the wind corrector on the Astro Tech Newts, and it just, I don't think it's built well enough that uh, you can do it, but uh, they really do uh, a good job building these. And of course, you're, you, if you're trying to get it to f2.6, you're going to have to spend some time collimating. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that's the drawback by you so fast. Um, Eric is asking, can you use an, uh, an AO, so an adaptive optics? And I'm not sure if he's asking that based off the back focal distance or just whether the AO will, inter, uh, will interact properly with the program. I guess it's going to act similar to auto-guiding, right? I don't know if you can answer that. 
No, I'm not. I'm not sure. I have not uh, heard of someone using it with the adaptive optics, so I, I can't answer that really. Okay, you're kind of going against the whole unguided yeah. precept in that in that sense, but at the same time, um, a lot of the newts are, are wider field, whereas AO would be probably for higher resolution. Yeah, and also focusing gets uh, more demanding when you have a fast. 2.7, you need to be very accurate at focus. Yep. Well, uh, this is probably the, the perfect setup to use focus lock on. I don't know if you've seen it in our previous... Yeah, yes, I've seen the focus lock. I think it was some problem with the back focus. I was actually thinking about using that to have a real-time real update of the focus. That is really perhaps needed if you have very short focal length. But I think it was not very suited for this uh, tube. I don't think maybe, so. maybe. Yeah, he was demonstrating it with um, the on-axis guider. Uh, yeah. But I guess you're not guiding, so you're not going to no. have a separate guide camera on there. Uh, um, no, perhaps, but uh, I yeah. will perhaps look into that more. It's interesting. So you, you'd almost be using an off-axis guider just for focus. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, if you're imaging at f2.8, well, I guess it, it depends on the temperature uh, temperature stability of the tube, which is probably pretty good. Uh, How have you carbon. found the temperature? Yeah, go I ahead. I think that is good, pretty good. This carbon fiber in the tube, so I, I think it should not... I have not seen any drift problem with the... Uh, that you in that respect. Very cool. They built some nice stuff. Yeah. Um. So I can. I, I this is an image from this 800 millimeters, five minutes with a Canon 5D cooled camera, an M1, very in cool image. On. Uh, this was not processed special, just quick first light image from the Asa guys in Greece, in Europe. It was not in the best place also. And I have this video about the track. I can show it short, about how the software works. Stop, start up, setting up uh, what guide catalog and uh, uh, what kind of dome they have. And then they start, this is a six meter uh, focal line scope. So in this case, they use 100, I think 90 stars in the pointed pipe. So here they start the run. See. So they have selected stars. Okay, so now they start and go off. So now the software automatically sleeves to every star, take an image, and you can see maximum deal on the left. And it plate solves and save every correction. You see the to the right the yellow spot. Now the fast forwarding, of course, is very fast. So uh, the, they move all over the sky in this case and take a sample of. Let's see, move forward. Ah, let's see. Okay. Okay, I can move it to some. So they have pointing after they made the point of file, they make a, a sleeve to a star to see how it goes. You see they use the Sky X and you see they have the same software as the, the small end. But this is the 800 millimeter scope. And uh, you can see how good accuracy they have in pointing there. Because yes. I can see the, the, the hit the star in the middle of this was a six meter focal length scope. And the star in the dead center. 
after the major point. So that's a very high uh, accuracy for a point of view. So, you, so they all, always use unguided with these modes. Yeah. Did you say six meter focal six. length? Yeah, this it, this is eight hundred A set eight hundred. So it's six point five meters focal length on this scope, huh. and it, and they hit the star and dead center when they sleep. After the, the meter point, they had a one hundred nine. They have more stars when they have bigger focal lengths. They, they, this need perhaps need more stars to get better pointing accuracy. If you have a uh, not so long focal and you don't need more than five, 10 to 50 stars. So uh, this is uh, a bit impressive to, to with a such long focal length, have a good track, uh, pointing and track. Also. Yeah, that's about what I had. So we'll see what's happened with the new mount. Would that be interesting for the amateur? This uh, re six, this revolution will come next year or not? They will they integrate it. That, that's very good for field setup. You can just place the mount, and it should be automatic. Or a mind. So more details. I have no more details about how the uh, will work, but it's, it will be an interesting product. It's not so very 18 kilograms. So it's not so very heavy, also. Right. Okay. Any more questions? Otherwise, I'm finished with the um, presentation. I don't think there's any other questions for you. I see some questions popping around. Uh, um, chat. Basically, the support. How is the sub How have you found the support from ASA? Uh, yeah, Go ahead. Yeah, and it's a bit lacking. I would say as as I, I think. They have a forum, and the guys on the forum all often help each other. But if you have actual problem with them, some warranty problem or something, that's very, they're very quick to respond. And uh, the software guy who made the software, he actually he have a team viewer session to my computer and updated the software. So you can sometimes get very fast and responsive response. But generally, they're a bit slow on the Amateur side of the support as a right because the, the I think the main focus is a bit for the professional side, so uh, uh, that's the drawback. So it's not very best, not very best support perhaps. But I, I also heard some rumors about 10 micron had not also perhaps the best support also. So it could be different between. Vendors, but that could be very good improvement in the support thing. But a good forum, which a good start for people to help help out, I think. Okay, and one question now: uh, Do you know the what the DDM60 REV will cost? And I think you said you didn't, but no, no, no I really, I hope it will be around the same price as the current, perhaps around nine thousand. That would be my guess. Because if they make a scope, should not be a, perhaps higher than that. I hope. Because you see, the DDM60 in the image here don't don't actually have absolute encoders. But it's not so very important to have absolute encoders. My DDM85 don't also don't have uh, absolute encoders because I bought it about two years ago now. So so I can upgrade it if I like. But uh, you can't upgrade the 60, DM60. But uh, the actual drawback, if you don't have absolute encoder, that you have to need a, uh, you need to press a button called Home Find. So the scope moves, and they have some sensor in the encoders, so the, it, it moves over the sensor, and and in that case, they know where it is in the sky. So it's only a feature to speak to have absolute encoders. Then the main thing is the, the range of encoders, which is in place in all modes. So from this year, they have only absolute. So then you need to start the mount and you start tracking, actually. actually. And then it's ready to set. So it's very quick startup time. 
Very cool. Very, very cool. Thank you, Krister. That's yeah. a great presentation. And we got a good idea as to how the ASA mounts run. And uh, I don't know, yeah. maybe uh, maybe we'll have a few purchasers out there. Yeah. yeah I hope, see what the other vendors are, are coming with direct drive or not. I'm not sure. What, I hope this direction will be more direct drive mounts, perhaps, in the future. And we already looked it up. We know that if you would like to buy one of these, OPT sells them. Uh, I haven't found any other uh, U.S. vendors, but uh, I, I think there might be a few others out there. But uh, really cool. Yeah. Um, I don't see any further questions, so if you have any questions, pop them in right now. Uh, but basically, I just want to remind everyone that next week, Jasem Mutlock will be on... Uh, presenting on EKOS, Indie, and KSTARS, which is basically Linux-based uh, acquisition, or I should say full mount and automation control software, and that, uh, being Linux-based, will run on some of these teeny computers like the, um, I want to say Raspberry Pi, but I think it's actually, what's the other one, the... Uh, uh, I forget. Uh, it's escaping me. But it'll be a cool presentation. If you uh, if you want, um, I don't know, something basically the size of your wallet to run your entire scope, uh, then you can have it now. Um, Odroid. Uh, there, there's a few of them out there now. So uh, uh, it is Raspberry Pi. There we go. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, he, he's a better Arduino. There we go. He's a better one to explain it than me because I'm uh, I know a little bit about them, uh, but uh, he knows a lot about them, so he'd be the best one. And that'll be next week, um, guys. Thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope you liked the chat, which seems to be working out kind of well for us. And uh, hopefully, we'll have some better ways to view this. But uh, I don't know, YouTube. Uh, you may or may not know this, but uh, you can change the resolution in YouTube. That's something we didn't have with Google+. Plus. It may make the presentation a little bit better. I'm actually noticing that the resolution is better uh, for me. Um, I can actually see his presentation perfectly. Uh, and we're getting comments in chat. Yeah, people like this. So it seems to be working out. And I think the chat will actually stay active for a little while after we end the session. So... That works out, too. And I also believe that the chat may be active a little bit before we start the session. So if you have advanced questions, it might be a good way to get them in there. But hey, we're still figuring this stuff out as you guys figure it out. So uh, that's all I, I've got for now. I don't see any new questions. So again, I'm going to thank Christopher, Christopher coming on. It's probably 4.30 a.m. where he is, so he's staying up late for us. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, can people still get into a room like in Hangouts? Yes, so we do have people in the room. And uh, I've, I had a few people ask if I want to get in here, how can I? If you have something important that has to do with the presentation or say you own an ASA mount and you want to get into the room or you own an uh, Indie K-Stars or you're using that program, um, give me contact me at contact at theastromagingchannel.com or contact me on Google+, and I'll get you the Hangout link to get in live so you can take part in the conversation. Um, but that's that's basically it. Um, again, Krister, thank you. Yeah, thanks. And, nice. uh, well, basically that's it. So uh, we will see you guys next week. Have a good night.